Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Programme Committee for the very kind invitation to speak today on the Paul Glaucoma Implant. I have some financial disclosures and specifically the Paul Glaucoma Implant itself, which I co-designed and I do have a share in the patent. The Barvalt Glaucoma Implant is the most effective IOP lowering implant available to date, but it is very large. And the huge barbell contrasts dramatically with the MIGS trend towards much smaller subconjunctival tubes such as the Zen and the pressure flow. The barbell plate is large, however, for very good reason, as this is responsible for the high long-term efficacy level. But at 640 microns in diameter, like the AMID valve, the tube is far larger than required. The 640 micron barbell and valve tubes occupy the entire drainage angle and must rest on iris to avoid touching the cornea. And such tubes are in contact with cornea at their entry site, even when lying flat on the iris. We know that tube contact with corneal endothelium at the entry site kills endothelial cells, so this is not good. In mid-2020, having presented this uh, study at the American Glaucoma Society in Washington, D.C., we published the outcomes of 64 patients who were followed prospectively for five years after Barvalt Glaucoma implant, uh, implantation. We looked at uh, IOP, flare, position of tube at the entry site, and OCT parameters of, of tube position in relation to cornea. During the study, we examined the relationship between these parameters and central and peripheral corneal endothelial cell density and found that at five years, almost 37% of endothelial cells have been lost uh, centrally and 50% peripherally over the tube. However, when you look at the actual tube position of the entry site, tubes behind Schwalbe's line had less than half the endothelial cell loss that tubes that were straddling Schwalbe's line. So tube position at the entry site matters a lot and this was the most significant factor. A large tube on the scleral surface always carries a small risk of conjunctival erosion. This risk is reduced but not eliminated by a donor tissue patch or a long scleral tunnel. Minimally invasive subconjunctival tubes such as Zen gel implant are much smaller as is the pressure flow micro shunt. These tubes are not for complex cases, but do show that a small tube can produce a large IOP drop. On gonioscopy, the size difference between the bar belt and the Zen is quite dramatic. You can see here that the bar belt is bigger than the two Zens put together in this eye. Even the slightly larger pressure flow can fit inside the bar belt, though it's a very tight squeeze. Mixed tubes can also still erode, but the smaller subconjunctival tubes have a much lower erosion risk than the larger bar belt. And remember that they're not patched. These smaller tubes likely carry much lower risk of endothelial cell damage simply because of their size. At 342 mm squared, the pole glaucoma implant has a large surface area comparable to that of the bar belt. But there are subtle differences. The breadth is slightly less than that of the bar belt and the depth slightly greater. This in theory should result in more usable plate surface area that's not covered by rectus muscles. The tube portion of the pole glaucoma implant is much smaller than the bar belt and only slightly larger than a pressure flow. And you can see the two end to end here. And in profile, you can see that the bar belt is much larger than either the pole or the pressure flow, the pole being somewhere in between. The tube lumen of the pole glaucoma implant at 127 microns is smaller than that of an AMID valve or a bar belt implant. It can therefore be occluded with a 6-0 proline suture to reduce flow rather than 3-0, which is required for the bar belt. This tube is typically stented all the way into the anterior chamber. In most cases, that provides enough resistance to prevent early hypotony without additional ligation. The proline stent is seen here in the anterior chamber on gonioscopy. The PGI is implanted under adjacent recti like a bar belt, although the PGI does not extend as far under the muscles.
The plate, like a bar vault, is best placed 10 or more millimetres from the limbus. The plate is tightly secured to sclera using nanoproline sutures diagonally opposed to prevent any forward or lateral movement. The tube is trimmed bevel up so it will extend 1 to 2 millimetres into the anterior chamber. This side by side comparison with a 30 gauge needle shows just how small the tube is. The anterior chamber is entered with a 25 gauge needle just anterior and parallel to the iris plane. Ideally, the eye should be as close as possible to the primary position so that the tube does not point towards cornea in the anterior chamber. The tube is then gently fed into the anterior chamber. The back of the plate is then examined for aqueous drainage. In contrast to ligation of the tube, which risks high early IOPs, stenting permits regulation of aqueous flow. Aqueous can be visualised draining from the back of the plate. The dry sponge is inserted into the small well at the back of the plate and then slow aqueous filling of the well should be seen. If the well cannot be seen to be filling slowly, the pressure is likely to remain high in the early postoperative period. If aqueous drainage is brisk, there will be a very high risk of early postoperative hypotony. If aqueous drainage is brisk and the stent has not been fed right into the anterior chamber, then it can be advanced further, increasing resistance. If full length stenting creates insufficient resistance, the tube is then ligated with a tenoline-on suture that can be lasered at the slit lamp later. If no drainage is visible, the 6O can be withdrawn stepwise. Sometimes it only needs to be a few millimetres along the tube. If no drainage is visible, ensure the IOP is adequate. Here I'm injecting BSS with a 30 gauge needle as there's no paracentesis to ensure that the eye is pressurised. The well now seems to be filling again, although the use of fluorescein in this case hasn't really helped. Rarely I've found 6O proline to be too tight inside the tube and I resorted to using 7O. Overall, this simple flow technique minimises the post-operative extremes of IOP after the pole glaucoma implant. The tube is then secured tightly to sclera, either just before or after checking the flow. I use 9O nylon usually. In this case, I've used 9O proline. I position the knots away from the tube and away from the limbus as the knots can result in exposure. The subconjunctival end of the proline is secured to the sclera with tissue glue as is a human pericardial patch graft. The conjunctiva and tenons are then closed with tissue glue, assisted by two to three tenonylon sutures. We published the results of a one-year multi-center follow-up study of the pole glaucoma implant in ophthalmology glaucoma in mid-2020. 82 patients were enrolled and 74 patients completed a, a year of follow-up at six international centres. The mean age of enrolment was 62 years. 73% were men. Mean preoperative IOP was 23 millimetres of mercury on 3.3 medications. And at six months and 12 months, the pressures were 13.8 and 13.2 millimetres of mercury respectively on 0.3 medications. There were very few significant post-operative complications and the success rate was very high. Only four patients were considered to be surgical failures. 69% were deemed to be complete successes and 93.2% were considered qualified successes. And this was the mean medicated preoperative IOP with the highest preoperative IOP to the left. And you can see it's dropped to uh, round about 13 at one year and medications have dropped from 3.3 uh, to 0.3 with one at one year obviously this is just a large case series not a comparative trial however if we compare it with the barvelt outcomes in the pooled analysis of two prospective studies the amid barvelt comparison study and the amid versus barvelt study we see in 
the, this pooled analysis of two trials that at five years the AMID valve was achieving pressures of 16 on two medications and the bar valve was 13 on one and a half medications. However, if we go back to one year, we can see that at one year the results were fairly similar and the bar vault was actually achieving 13.7 and 1.4 medications which is comparable to the pole glucom implant at one year in our study. Uh, these are the results of our one year outcomes for the pole glucom implant. Uh, in fact the pole was producing slightly lower pressures than in the bar vault in the randomized clinical trial and uh, more than three millis mercury lower than the AMIT. In summary, the pole glucom implant seems to have a similar efficacy to a bar valve with a smaller tube and a 6 stenting technique. The 6 stenting technique seems to be more predictable than our similar experience with the bar valve. In other words, the 6 seems to work without ligation most of the time, although occasionally the 6 is too tight and occasionally we need to ligate. The smaller tube is likely to produce less endothelial cell loss and probably will give us a lower erosion rate, though these uh, claims have yet to be proven. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much to the organisers for the very kind invitation.